Thank you, David, and uh, thank you for that introduction. And I am a big supporter of Building Strength webinars. I really believe in what you're doing. And I encourage anybody who's tuning in right now to check out the archives of Building Strength webinars for some very, very interesting and informative uh, 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 webinars that have, that have gone before me. And it's just a whole education in and of itself. Well, today we're going to be talking, uh, this is part three of the series, Cancer and Toxins, and this is about the toxins in food, what's in my food. Uh, so what I decided to do was um, just go ahead and take, take a look at some typical foods that are on our, our dining tables, because chances are pretty good that your food has been genetically modified, treated with pesticides, herbicides, irradiated, treated with antibiotics, preserved, colored, flavored, and even texturized. So that is, is what we're going to look at is, is what are the residuals in the food and what's being taken into our bodies as a result. And I thought we would take a look at the food holiday and a, a, a meal that we're all familiar with, just good old traditional Thanksgiving dinner. Turkey and dressing, sweet potatoes, green beans, salad, apple pie, and then the milk and water to, to make up whatever you'd be making up your gravy with or maybe your, your, your pie crust, even the wheat in the pie crust we're going to take a look at. And the uh, next several slides are uh, composed of data that was taken from the um, USDA Pesticide Data Program. Now this is a program that's no longer in existence, but these are the most recent statistics we have and from the 2007-2008 calendar year, and I'll explain more as to um, that, how that, that, data, that, that, that program is no longer being updated. But this has to do with pesticide residues found in common foods according to the United States Department of Agriculture. So we start off with the turkey. Um, seven pesticide residues uh, were found at last count in um, Turkey and um, these are, I'm not going to try to uh, pronounce some of these things or bore you with the chemical names, but these are pesticide residues and I have a hint for you, if you cannot pronounce it, one, it's not natural and two, it doesn't belong in food. Um, now, what the percentages show is that only, for instance, 2.3% of turkeys tested, or this is just fowl in general tested, had, for instance, piperonal butoxide in it. And the percentages go down for, from there. There are seven pesticide residues that have been found in fowl, and what I've been putting on these slides is just the top five residues. So pesticide-wise, um, there's definitely a lot, th a lot of different chemicals there, but percentage-wise, not bad compared to some other things. However, among those pesticide residues, two of them are known or probable cancer-causing agents. Four of them are suspected to be hormone disruptors. One of them is toxic to the nervous system, and one of them causes developmental or, or reproductive problems. Now that was the breast meat, and the thigh meat it concentrates uh, pesticides more. And there were eight pesticide residues found in the thigh meat, three of them causing cancer, five suspected to cause interruption in the way we process our hormone chemical messengers, one of them toxic to the neuro neurologic system, and two of them developmental or reproductive toxins. Now, why should we be worried about hormone interrupters? Well, I don't know if you were listening to the news yesterday, but the Journal of Pediatrics just released a study. It's an update from a study that was done 10 years ago, and they're looking at large populations of school-age girls and finding out when it is that they begin to show sexual maturity. And what it showed that in 2010, there's twice the number of seven and eight-year-olds that are already developing breasts as if they were early teens than there was only 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, about 5% of seven to eight-year-old girls were showing premature sexual development. Um, but in 2010, anywhere from 10 up to 23% of seven to eight-year-old girls are already showing breast development. This is really, really alarming. The reason there's a spread in the percentages there, the 10 to 23 percent, it was a, about 10 percent for white seven-year-old girls, and it was around 14 percent for Hispanic uh, seven-year-old girls, and then it was 
closer to 23% for uh, non-Hispanic black seven-year-old girls already developing breasts at the age of seven. Uh, this is something that is, is a very recent development. It's, being, it's been followed for the last 30 years or so, but we're really seeing an alarming rate of this. Hormone interrupters are, are pretty scary. Now the other thing that's found in, in fowl though is antibiotic residues and nearly 100% of samples show um, some representation of some antibiotics. You can see on this list erythromycin, that's one that's also given to humans, but there are several other antibiotics that are used in commercial, commercially raised fowl. The problem with this, according to, um, to some people, is what we're seeing so much now, we're seeing antibiotic resistant infections occurring in people who aren't even immune compromised. In other words, we used to see these highly resistant infections only in people who themselves didn't have an operating immune system, such as people that had AIDS or were compromised by cancer chemotherapy or were organ transplant recipients or people who had severe malnutrition. But nowadays, everyday people who are well enough to go to work and school are coming down with antibiotic resistant infections. And one of the theories is that it's because of so much antibiotics in our food. And unlike the pesticides, these antibiotic residues were found in nearly 100% of the poultry that was tested. Now let's take a look at some of the vegetables on the Thanksgiving dinner table. Uh, green beans, uh, according to the USDA, they found 44 pesticide residues. Five of them known or probably causing cancer, 16 suspected hormone disruptors, seven of them toxic to the nervous system, and six of them developmental or reproductive toxins. In celery, that would be in your stuffing, 64 pesticide residues, 11 causing cancer, 31 disrupting our hormones, 12 of them toxic to the nervous system, and 13 affecting the developmental or reproductive system. Now, this is just a list of the top five residues in celery. Unlike the poultry, where we saw up to 2 to 3 percent having pesticide residues, in something like celery, it's 100 percent of, of the celery tested had some pesticide residues. So I just listed here, out of the over 60 residues found in celery, I just listed the top five. And the top two are found in 100% of celery plants that were sampled, and the others, as you can see, are there, you know, in, in you know, anywhere from 39 to to 50% of celery tested. Let's take a look at the wheat that makes the breadcrumbs in the stuffing, and in the pie crust, 16 pesticide residues. If you don't buy organic, three of them causing cancer, nine suspected of being hormone disruptors five toxic to the nervous system, and three affecting developmental or reproductive system. And here's the top five residues, malathion, bad stuff. I mean, this, this, th these are very serious toxins. And again, you could see the percentages, the, the two of them at the top there, you know, found in 49% and 20% and respectively of all wheat sampled. How about the milk that you're going to make your gravy with? Well, there's 12 pesticide residues that were found in that, four of them causing cancer, eight disrupting our hormones, four of them toxic to the nervous system, and three toxic to the developmental or reproductive system. And here's the top uh, five residues found of, of all those in milk. And again, we're looking at anywhere from 15 to 90, 91% of the samples had these residues in it. Sweet potatoes, those are good for you, right? Well, eight pesticide residues if you don't buy organic. Thank God none of them are uh, developmental or reproductive toxins, but the hormone disruptors are bad enough. How about the lettuce? One of our most highly pesticided crops, 51 pesticide, re pesticide residues, 10 of them uh, known or suspected of causing cancer, 21 of them hormone disruptors, nine neurotoxins, and nine developmental or reproductive toxins. Well, what about apples for the apple pie? 42 pesticide residues, five of them causing cancer, nine of them 19 of them disrupting hormones, 10 neurotoxins, and eight developmental or reproductive toxins. I hope you're thinking about an alternative to your normal Thanksgiving dinner by now. 
And again with apples, when they looked at what percent of the apples tested had these residues, it's very, very high for the top five residues found in apples. So the, the, the top uh, residue found, it was present in almost 88% of the apples that were tested. And then of course you have to have some water at Thanksgiving, 59 pesticide residues in typical household tap water, 9 that can cause cancer, 20 suspected hormone disruptors, 7 neurotoxins, and 19 of them affecting developmental or reproductive system. And again, when they look at what percent of these water samples tested positive for the number one um, residue, 93.9% .9 of the samples were positive. Now this was all based on data from the United States Department of Agriculture's pesticide program and it was uh, collecting data by doing representative samples across the country and they would do it every year and give the data but it ended in 2008 and what I've given you here is the most recent data that's available and there is at this time no comparable ongoing monitoring and reporting program available. Um, there's, there's no funding for it and under the Bush administration this, this program was uh, doomed to be, to be ended even though it, um, it ended in a later administration. The, um, the budget cuts actually happened many years earlier. Um, now let's take a look also aside from pesticides and antibiotics, something else that can be in our food and that is the crops that are genetically modified. Now genetically modified means that the food plants are engineered to be herbicide tolerant. The idea there was to get a better crop yield by um, not losing a lot of the plants to the toxins that were sprayed on the plants in order to handle the weeds around them. So basically they bred plants that tolerate weed killer better. And what the way they do it is they actually implant little slips of genetic material from specially bred bacteria. They take the genes from that specially bred bacteria, the genes that are bred to, these bacteria are bred to be resistant to the weed killer and they splice them into the plant's genetic material. And then they, that, that's what they make the genetically modified seeds out of. So when they plant these seeds, they they are able to, to, to tolerate, the plants are able to tolerate otherwise deadly doses of weed killer. So what happens? Well the, uh, the advantage would be that the crops don't die off when the fields are sprayed and the idea would be well then we get rid of weeds and, and we have higher survival of our plants. But um, what happens is anybody who buys the genetically modified seed is locked in with a contract with the same company to buy their herbicide and we'll take as the single example the, the largest producer and, and supplier of genetically modified organisms on the planet and that's Monsanto. They make uh, most of the genetically modified seeds that's available in commercial, for commercial farmers. You can hardly call them farmers anymore, they're, they're food industrialists. So the, they sell them the seed but they're also bound by contract to buy a certain number of years worth of Monsanto's other product, uh, Roundup, Roundup weed killer. So let's take a look at what has actually happened. Well, more herbicides are used, per, you know, and that's predictable. Obviously that was the whole point, that you could spray more weed killer and still have the, pan survive, the, the plant survive. But what they looked at is over 8,000 research trials on this and what was found is that so-called Roundup Ready soybeans uh, require even more weed killer, more Roundup than the non-genetically modified plants. In other words, more, more weeds grow around them. So those, those crops actually require uh, 2 to 500 percent of the Roundup that a non-genetically modified soybean plant would require. So this was a lot more um, pesticide or, or herbicides, I mean, weed killer than what had prior been allowed by the EPA. So the response of the EPA was simply to up the allowable limit for pesticide residues. I mean, sorry, for for uh, herbicide residues on soybeans. Um, 
And what happened is that increased food costs, obviously, because they're using two to five times more herbicide, and they have to buy these special seeds, which are more expensive. They get either the same or slightly less crop yield. In other words, it did not result in, in greater crop yield, as, as was predicted. Um, and obviously, it's increased pollution because all that weed killer is running off and polluting the soil and it ultimately increases the cost to the consumer but of course Monsanto goes straight to the bank. Now there are some controversies in genetically modified crops. This webinar is not going to go into that although it could definitely be an entire webinar on its own and, and they are what about cross-pollination? What about a neighboring farmer who does not have genetically modified organisms but there's, his plants get pollinated with uh, some of the pollen from from the plant, you know, the Roundup Ready soybeans, and then he's stuck with having to buy Roundup. There can also be pollination in the other direction that the company's not too happy with. Um, there's no long-term studies whatsoever on, in humans on what is the effect of of eating genetically modified organisms. Um, you know, in an entire population. And of course, it's a tremendous loss of biodiversity when you're just putting out one kind of seed for 90% of the soybeans available in this country, you really lose biodiversity. So if there is some, some pesticide, pest or something that comes along or there is some sort of genetic, uh, I mean, sorry, environmental change that happens, and that crop can't adapt to it, well, then you lose 90% of your crop that year because you don't have biodiversity. And also, ultimately, the seed is owned by the company and it's not really owned by a farmer. These seeds tend not to propagate themselves. They don't harvest seeds from the, the maturing plant. They have to buy new seeds every single year from Monsanto. So the health risks, this is actually, um, from an article that was done looking at what is actually in these soybeans. And I'd like to just read this quote, the Monsanto analyses, in other words, this was, these were analysis, analysis tests that were done by the Monsanto company themselves. The Monsanto analyses of glyphosate-resistant soy showed that the genetically modified line contained about 28% more of a certain protein. That protein in these genetically modified bean plants is a known anti-nutrient, keeps you from being able to use the nutrients that you do have, keeps you from, able to, from being able to use the nutrients in the plant itself, and it's an allergen, provokes allergy. And one thing that we're seeing today is a tremendously, tremendous increase in the number of people who are allergic to soy. And this could be one reason. These genetically modified plants are producing uh, proteins and enzymes that are anti-nutrient and are allergy provoking. So let's move on to something else that, that, that uh, is, in, is in our food supply, bovine growth hormone. So this is a hormone that in nature is made by cows to promote their growth and it also promotes milk production. But the little R in front of that, what I have on the slide there, stands for recombinant. And recombinant bovine growth hormone is a man-made hormone that looks like the hormone that cows would naturally make. So it's a man-made version of the cow's own growth hormone. And it does force more milk production. Now, the, the label put out by the manufacturer of recombinant bovine growth hormone the label by the manufacturer lists 20 possible adverse effects for the cow, but doesn't mention anything about what the adverse effects may be for humans. One of the things that we do know is that it shortens the life of the milk cow by up to two years, even though before then they do get increased milk production out of them. It definitely increases the risk of infection and therefore there's more antibiotic use and in turn more residuals of antibiotics in our milk. Uh, it increases the insulin-like growth factor number one in milk which in turn increases cell growth and the question is when humans consume this milk does that in turn increase the development of breast cancer or other cancers for that matter? 
But in this case, this growth hormone is something that really seems to affect the mammary tissues, the breast tissue. So it is a concern uh, regarding a, a possible link to breast cancer. Well, food these days, as you may know, is, is often irradiated. Um, it can be for the purpose of eliminating insects, to inhibit sprouting, for instance, on potatoes, uh, to delay ripening, or to sterilize or kill parasites. In fact, the earliest use of food irradiation never even made the papers. Um, people may not realize that um, to a great extent, potato crops in the United States have been irradiated since 1964, and that was to prevent sprouting. It's approved for use on wheat and potatoes, flour, spices, tea, fruits and vegetables, and uh, poultry, beef, pork, and lamb. What happens when food gets irradiated is there's a loss of nutrients. There can be a 50% loss of vitamin E, but the most significant loss is with, is with vitamin B1. There can also be losses of vitamin A and vitamin C. Now, um, what the government compares food irradiation to is conventional methods of getting rid of pests or inhibiting sprouting or, or impairing ripening. And what they say is that the effects of irradiation on processing food are, quote, similar to those uh, effects of conventional processing of food. Well, the bottom line here is you really should not be consuming processed food in large amounts because no matter which way you cut it, you're going to lose some nutrients. Um, on top of it, you have the flavorings and the colorings and, and, and the packaging processes to consider. Um, so what the FDA says, their official statement, is the radiation that's used on food is, quote, not strong enough to disintegrate the nucleus of even one atom of a food molecule. Now this is just, frankly, completely unbelievable. Um, if we were just talking about killing some pests around the food, maybe somebody could buy that, I don't. But when you talk about inhibiting ripening, and preventing sprouting, that's obviously not something that's going to happen without affecting the actual substance of the food itself. So this is, an, this, is a, this is an unbelievable quote that is on the current FDA website regarding food irradiation. It's, it's really ridiculous. I mean, it changes the flavor, it changes the consistency. Of course, the food's being affected molecularly. So all irradiated food is supposed to be marked with a special symbol and it's supposed to carry a notice that it's irradiated. And this is not enforced. So there's a lot of irradiated food that you may not know that it's irradiated. Um, I have a neighbor that actually works at a big grocery store in town and he works in the produce department. And I asked him, you know, in handling the bananas and such, do you see spiders? He goes, no, we never see any critters of any kind whatsoever. I mean, that stuff has been irradiated to a large extent. So at this point, I want to discuss a, a, a new term. It's actually a uh, supposedly a mental disease called orthorexia. And it's defined as an obsession with healthy or righteous eating. So this would be somebody who, um, you know, says they're allergic to soy and can't eat wheat and um, has to get everything, um, you know, that's, that's not genetically modified and only organic. And, uh, you know, it's, in other words, a fixation with healthy eating. And, and it's now being called by psychiatrists as a sign of a serious psychological disorder. So I don't know if by now in this webinar you have orthorexia or yet, but uh, I, apparently I do. So what can you do? Well, number one, grow your own. You'd be surprised what you can produce with uh, raised beds on a rooftop, uh, in an apartment kitchen window, or luxury of luxuries in your backyard. Um, you can buy local organic. Um, because of the definition of organic and some of the rules that go into it, some of your small local producers may not actually be able to claim, quote, organic, but just talk to them and find out what they're actually putting in their soil or how they're feeding their chickens or how they're, 
you know, what, what are the conditions under which they're, they're milking their goats or their cows, and you can find out whether it's truly natural or not, whether or not it actually carries the official organic label. Um, support a food safety group. There's plenty of them. Just type it into the Internet, and the movement is really growing. Uh, and, and then the, a big part of this is to educate other people. I'd refer you to seedsofdeception.com and that talks a lot about the genetically modified seeds and what's happening with the uh, corporations taking over our food supply and um, whatsonmyfood.org and there you can look up um, the USDA numbers from 2007. You can type in uh, almost any food they have on there and you could find out what pesticide residues um, have been found. And you can ultimately detoxify yourself. Now there's plenty of foods themselves that are detoxifying and here's just a partial list of some herbs that in one way or another either directly help you to de directly detoxify or they support your body's own detoxification mechanisms. And you'll see on here a lot of uh, green things. Uh, alfalfa's on there, dandelions on there, uh, chlorella's on there. So the superfoods, the, gr the, the green superfoods, are very, very good. Um, another really good one is psyllium seed and psyllium husk. It's it's really good for a lot of reasons. Um, what else do we have on here? Um, the milk thistle supports your liver's own detoxification. So there's there's lots of herbs that support detoxification or themselves are outright detoxifying. Um, there's there's fruit, foods that are detoxifying, fruits and vegetables, especially the dark leafy greens, um, kale, Swiss chard, uh, bok choy, uh, mustard greens, collard greens, cabbages, broccoli. And uh, then I have listed on here again the super greens, the algae, alfalfa, spirulina sort of family, even barley grass, wheat grass, uh, lemons, oranges, limes, very good for detoxification. In fact, uh, lemon juice in some room temperature water in the morning is, is a great alkalinizer and detoxifier. Uh, then some other things, broccoli sprouts, green tea, mung beans, seeds and nuts, and some omega-3 oils, especially from the plant sources rather than the fish sources. So one of the things I've talked about in, in the other webinars is the, the concept of a toxic body burden. You saw those, those lists of what pesticide residues are, are found on a Thanksgiving plate. So if we just take poultry, for instance, we may think, well, that's not so bad. And if we look at, well, celery, maybe we're just having a little bit of that. And, okay, so you'll skip the apple pie. And, okay, well, maybe you'll just have a little bit of the milk in the gravy instead of instead of a glass of milk, but all taken together and, and so many different pesticides attacking the body in so many different ways, there's this concept of what is your total body burden? And unfortunately, that is impossible to, to estimate. The only way we could really find out is, is to take the body and do what we do with the fruit, throw it in a blender and extract the chemicals from it and find out what we have. So what happens is we have repeated or ongoing low-level exposures of, of unknown mixtures, and it can be multiple organs that are affected, like you saw, the brain, the reproductive system, anything affected by hormones, cancer in any organ. And these effects can add up. They can become cumulative, um, and they can become synergistic, whereas one chemical itself might not be too bad. When it's paired with another chemical, the two together is what's really poison. And unfortunately, the usual tests, whether it's hair, saliva, blood, urine, don't tell the whole story because a lot of the, these things are, are stored in fat. And the fact is that 41% Americans are going to be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lifetimes, and, and half of them are going to die from it. Now, the, the ratio is supposed to go up to 50-50 in just a few years. That's not okay. The recent President's uh, Cancer Panel reported, this was just in April of this year, that the effect of environmental toxins has been grossly underestimated uh, and its impact on, on our cancer rates. So there's lots of different detoxification. I mentioned the herbs, I mentioned the detoxifying foods, and on Building Strength webinars, you can actually go in the archives and you can see um, several different webinars that have been presented on various detoxification methods. The one that I've had a lot of success with in referring patients to combines a traditional sweat program, which is historically the oldest 
uh, detoxification method that has ever been recorded and it combines it with modern day science by using uh, a B vitamin that is a primo detoxifier and that is niacin so combining a sweat program with niacin because niacin actually can repair uh, DNA breaks, the breaks in our genetic material. It regulates the detox pathways in our liver. And it's needed in order to take these foreign substances and get them transformed to put into such a state that the body can then expel them. And it regenerates the body's number one detoxifier, which is glutathione. So it's, it's niacin, but in addition, it's providing a person with with good fat. If, if a lot of toxins are stored in the fat, we have to convince the body to let go of that fat so those toxins could come out. But the body won't let go of that until it has something to replace it with. So we want to replace it with some, some good fat that's not going to be a source of storing toxins. So we do that with lecithin, which actually helps break down the bad fat, and cold-pressed organic oils. Now we have to substitute these oils if a person is allergic to one or more components of them, but the idea is to have organic cold pressed oils. And then in addition some people may need some evening primrose oil. Along with the niacin dose which goes up in, on, on a gradient uh, schedule a little bit at a time, it goes up and up and up as the person can tolerate it while they're in the sauna sweating, we also increase the support of vitamins because the niacin is so tremendously active in the body that these other vitamins will get consumed. And so we have to increase the support of vitamins along with the niacin dose as it goes up. Minerals are a really important part of this program, particularly the minerals that you take in large doses, calcium and magnesium. In spite of the degree or the amount of CalMag, calcium and magnesium, that is given to p participants in the program, we do not have a problem with people getting um, uh, uh, kidney stones or anything like that in this program. In addition, we have to keep up with the trace minerals, and you see them listed here, particularly the, the zinc is, is, and, the, and the potassium are very important with that. So just because we're talking about food, I, I want to bring up again a slide I had in one of my earlier um, lectures on detoxification, and that is the study that was done in Michigan. Some, uh, some raw pesticide actually accidentally got added into a feedlot and into the beef feed, and they actually biopsied people who had eaten this beef, uh, biopsied their fat, and they found 16 pesticide residues uh, in, in their human fat. And um, they went through the sauna detox, and immediately afterward, uh, 13 of these pesticide residues were diminished. But four months after the program was completed, all 16 toxins were decreased. And this shows that this program not only detoxifies you during the program, but it actually continues to um, assist your body in effective detoxification long down the road. So this program is very closely supervised and everything's done on a step-by-step -step gradient approach and particularly that's monitored by the dose of niacin. It starts off slow and gets, gets quite high. In the meantime, a person is, is uh, sweating it out. So there, there is a natural way to recover, to rejuvenate, and to reduce your risks and it can really help quite a bit with things that your conventional medical doctor uh, you know, kind of throws up his hands about or maybe gives you a psychiatric drug in order to handle or simply ignores. Things like you know, pain, breathing problems, nagging allergy symptoms, trouble sleeping, mental fogginess, uh, you know, low energy, lack of vitality. One of the things we find when people go through this uh, sweat program is thereafter when they, uh, let's say they eat a, a sandwich that has some typical lunch meat on it, which is loaded with preservatives, they can really, really taste the chemicals and they have a distaste for it. They, they, they don't, they dislike for it. They don't like it because for the first time they're actually noticing it. They're, they've been so detoxified that when they have it again, they, they, actually, they actually notice it. So it's, it's sort of a, a natural step to moving over to, to eating more healthy because your body then can recognize something that's not good for it. Uh, so if, you would, if you'd like more information on this detoxification program, 
uh, you can call you can click on the um, the upper right hand corner to visit my website the, you know of your of your webinar screen or you can uh, to just type in sonapeer.net and you can find out more about the sonapeer program and, and and like I said there are other um, detoxification programs but this is one I've had the most experience with and the most tremendous results so at this time I'm going to answer some questions uh, let's see, what do I think of borage oil instead of evening primrose? The studies that have been done on this sweat detox program have been done with evening primrose, which not everybody ends up taking. It's only an as-needed thing. Um, so borage is, is a very nutritious oil. I do recommend it particularly for, for women in the perimenopause stage. Um, but I don't actually have experience with it as a, as a component of this program. If somebody for some reason cannot take evening primrose oil, I, I would imagine that borage would be a, a viable alternative. But again, most people just really take the core group of, of, of pure oils and, unless they're allergic. Um, so, um, you know, I, I don't mean to, to scare people off of their Thanksgiving dinner. Um, it's just to raise awareness of what's actually there and, and, and encourage people to not be passive about it. It's a lot to confront and it would be very convenient to ignore it. And that's really what we're doing when we eat out a bunch at places that don't serve organic. We're just sort of ignoring it. Um, some people have had the habit for a long time of buying only organic when it comes to milk and meat, meat and cheese and eggs and chicken. In other words, when they're buying animal products because there's, there's this concept of bioconcentration. The higher up on the food chain uh, an, an animal is, the more the toxins are going to be concentrated. Um, but as you can see, the fruits and vegetables are and the grains are very highly pesticided in this country and this is really an endorsement of going all organic particularly if you can buy local you know local farmers markets I live in Austin Texas and, and we have several here but but we especially have one that's one of the top five organic markets in the country and I for one go to it because I want those organic farmers to be able to continue to make a living I want them to to stay in business so that they're there for me when I want the option of, of organic food. I went to my regular grocery store this evening and in their entire produce department I could only find six organic items. So the vast majority of what they had w was definitely not organic. Okay, what do I think of grapeseed oil? Grapeseed definitely has some health benefits. I think it can be a very beneficial oil. It does have some inherent uh, detoxification activity, but um, like I said, this program is has not has not included grapeseed oil, and unless somebody's allergic, um, I, I really you know have not used it in this. The amount of oil used in this program is a little bit to begin with, and it does get up to moderate doses as you increase the niacin. But the, the program is three to five weeks long. And um, you know you, you don't really continue the oils when you're done. We we do recommend that people only continue to to cook or, or eat salads with um, you know the extra virgin olive oil with the cold pressed uh, organic source oils. Um, this this sauna pure program is a long range deep tissue detoxification program. It's something that would not have to be repeated for 10 or 15 years. And it handles things from the present time all the way back for the history of your body. So it, it really is, is something that's, that's unique for a detoxification program. It's not a liver flush. It's not an ongoing program. It's something that you would, um, you would utilize to handle whatever's accumulated to the present time. Um, let's see, um, what else do we have here? If we have any more questions, um, what if a person can't tolerate the heat? That's an excellent question. This program is all about gradients. Uh, the temperature of the sauna is anywhere from 140 to 170 degrees. 
Now obviously your body does not get up to that temperature. Anybody who has a normal temperature regulating mechanism of their body simply starts sweating. That's our way of handling heat. And we give you plenty of water and electrolytes so that you can sweat. Um, sometimes when the program is first started, a person can only tolerate three minutes in the sauna and then they're coming out and cooling off for five or ten minutes before they go back in. So the cumulative amount of time in the sauna is increased on a gradient approach according to what that individual can tolerate. Um, and, and everybody has to go on a gradient. We actually prevent people from going in there and staying in there for, for an hour. I mean, that's just they're just going to overheat. Um, the the uh, first webinar I did on this included a quote that I'll repeat now, no one ever drowned in sweat. And that was from Lou Holtz, former Notre Dame football coach. And, and the point is, as long as the person stays well hydrated, enough electrolytes, um, then they are going to be able to tolerate the sweat as long as, the, as, it, it, as it does go on a stepwise approach according to um, you know, how much they can stand of it. So that's one reason why the program needs to be very closely supervised because left to their own devices an individual will either bail out when the going gets tough or they will go um, too, too long in the sauna by themselves and, and get heat exhaustion and dehydration and then say forget it. So that, that's one reason for the intense supervision. Question is why do some people not sweat? Uh, I have a friend in a wheelchair who cannot sweat at all. Uh, well, um, one of the things that is in this program is we guarantee that you will sweat and it could be because the person is dehydrated, does not have enough minerals, so the body tends to hold on to it. It could be some medications. There are medications that will interfere with the program. And before somebody actually does the program, we actually do quite a bit of taking their medical history. Uh, they do have to get an exam by a physician and make sure they can go through it. But one of the things we do is we look at all their medications. And there are certain medications that are going to impair sweat. In fact, there's quite a long list of them. Uh, there's certain medications that are going to interfere with the action of the niacin, the detoxification action. There's certain medications that are going to inhibit the detoxification capacity of the liver, and we need all those things to be working well in this program. So we do work with the person to get them to the point where they can take the supplements. For somebody who, quote, doesn't sweat, we would start them off on, on uh, you know, very short periods in the sauna and just increase it gradually. The niacin itself causes a tremendous flushing and we don't go for the no flush niacin, we go for the real McCoy and that dilates the blood vessels and then combined with that a person does a bit of physical exercise and for somebody in a wheelchair we could find adaptive things that they could do, for instance the arm ergonometer, it's kind of like an arm bicycle or different things that they could do to get the sweat going in combination with the niacin, so it's the niacin a bit of exercise to get the sweat going and then you're in and out of the sauna just enough to get a rolling sweat going and keep the sweat going. Um, let's see, um, if there, you know, I, it says here that the person that they mentioned was not on medication, so good, that's ruled out. Um, believe me, every person can be made to sweat. We would also, um, in, in some people who have certain medical conditions or, or just certain conditions, we would say, well, let's make sure their, their hormones are okay, particularly their thyroid hormone. Let's make sure their blood pressure is okay. There's a few things that, c that can affect sweating. Let's make sure that their electrolytes are all right, their adrenal glands are functioning good, their kidneys are working. So there's just some basic tests that are done before somebody goes in. We don't do a big battery of tests on everyone. Uh, on the other hand, some people, you know, need need much more setup uh, to be able to tolerate the program than other people. But everyone, I guarantee you, can be made to sweat. Let's take a look at another question. Uh, for middle-aged men that have been diagnosed with low testosterone, what would I recommend to them after chelation or, uh, let's see, or trying to left-click here. I'm not getting it on the left-click can't read the rest of the question. Um, so uh, the solution to low testosterone is bioidentical testosterone. 
Uh, once we have removed any other toxin cause that might be contributing to that, and once we removed any drugs that may be inhibiting the production of testosterone. So this, the solution to low testosterone is to administer bioidentical testosterone, which is widely available these days. One of the interesting things about testosterone, I'm sorry I didn't make a slide on it, is just like the slide I showed on the breast development in young girls, they've been testing about every 10 years a representative sample of American men and looking at what their average testosterone levels are over a certain age range and they have found that average testosterone levels are dropping decade by decade. What a 40 or 50 year old man has as a quote normal testosterone today is much lower than what a 40 or 50 year old man had 10 years ago which was lower again than what he had 20 years ago. I'm not talking about the same person who was 20 years old and then became 30 and then became 40. Yes, that guy's testosterone goes down. I'm talking about the general overall population of men. Our average testosterone levels in this country are dropping quite rapidly. So one thing that you can't do when you go to a doctor and get your testosterone level checked, you can't let your doctor compare you to what's quote normal average American male because that number re represents a a hormone disrupted population. You want to look at what your level would have been expected to be when you were about 30 years old. That's when you had your peak testosterone and probably your peak health. Uh, let's see another question here. Um, uh, okay, um, no I guess that's the same question regarding what about after? What we like to do in, in some people, they actually benefit from balancing their hormones before they start the detoxification program. Um, depends on their age, depends on their symptoms. I certainly wouldn't want a woman who's having a hot flash every hour to then on top of that go into the sauna detox. I want to adjust her hormones before she starts. Everybody needs their thyroid adjusted before they go in, but an interesting thing about this program is they, if they are on thyroid medications, it's very common that their thyroid medication dose requirement would decrease after the, the detox, um, just based on the actual levels. This is, this is, a, this is uh, more true for people who have what's called subclinical hypothyroidism, which means that the thyroid test levels are still within the normal range but they're at the very low end of the normal range and we find that after the detox they their thyroid hormone levels can come up a bit this isn't true for everyone but we've seen it often enough that we we keep an eye on it or, or we recommend that their doctor recheck their their hormone requirements when they're done this is a physical detoxification program and yet <coughs> It's not um, something that needs to be, um, you know, medically supervised every day by a doctor. A doctor does have to um, give you the approval to take part in the program to make sure that you can withstand the program. It's a niacin, a little bit of exercise, and a lot of sauna and a lot of sweating. Uh, we do not let people lose weight in the program. We keep an eye on their weight because usually if they lose weight, they're losing water weight and we don't want that to happen because we don't want anybody to become dehydrated. But it's something that uh, is, is a um, biological and a mechanical program um, and yet it, it's something that can be done you know, safely without you know, uh, a doctor you know, being there supervising every little bit of it. Uh, once you do have the doctor's approval to start the detox. How long does the program take? Um, it takes from three to five weeks. I think in an earlier webinar I mentioned two to four weeks. Everybody is, is different, but we do ask people to arrange their schedules to expect that it might take up to five weeks. It's different for everybody. Not everybody needs to get up to the maximum dose of niacin in order to get maximum detoxification. So it's, uh, it really appreciates the biochemical individuality. We're, we're different genetically, we're different size-wise, and we're quite different in terms of the total body burden of the toxins. So it's, it's a very individual program. 
There is a person who is supervising it directly there all the time. And in addition, there is a case supervisor who's getting the daily reports, seeing what happened to each individual in the program and is advising how to step up the niacin and um, you know looking for that that endpoint. Uh, yes, they go into the sauna every single day. It is a daily program because one day builds on the other. So it's very, very important for a person not to miss a day. Uh, some people have actually done this program while they're still going to work, uh, but a lot of people treat it as a spa treatment and reduce their work schedule or take off work for the duration of being able to do this. Uh, it depends on, you know, really, uh, you know, your own schedule and how, how physically fit you are. Um, and I've done it on, on people as, as old as their 70s and, and indeed children have gone through this. So um, it's, it's something that, um, like I said, we really keep track of your blood pressure, your, your weight, and uh, checking out what's happening to you on a daily basis so we make it possible for you to do this, but it is an every single day program. It's the nature of the detoxification and the gradient approach of increasing the niacin where it just builds on itself that we really need to keep it going on a daily basis to get the, the end point that we're looking for. Um, how do you determine when a person is detox? Okay, this is getting into to more detail than th this could be, you know, a, a much longer answer. If you, I would refer you to the book uh, Clear Body, Clear Mind and it describes the end phenomena of the detoxification. There's several different things that can happen. Um, the niacin causes a flush and uh, with this flushing a person um, can, can experience in the detox, they can actually be aware of, of detoxing. Sometimes that's a taste of a particular drug Sometime, or, or medication, recreational drug, anesthetic, Novocaine, something like that. Sometimes it's a particular mental or emotional phenomenon. Um, and sometimes, uh, like I mentioned in the last webinar, people can see the patterns of various sunburns because niacin is something that seems to address uh, radiation toxicity. Uh, so one of the things we look at is what's the reaction to the niacin as the person is getting in the higher and higher doses. The other thing is the person themselves really becomes quite aware of when they're detoxing, like when something is so-called running out. And, and once that running out is, is not happening anymore, they really notice it. So in conjunction with working with the case supervisor and the sauna supervisor, um, you, you know, people usually know when, when they're done. And it's not when, oh, I'm just tired of sweating. There, there's definitely an end phenomena there. The other thing we find is that people, um, they're, they get a resurgence in their energy and their mental and emotional outlook, uh, totally aside what's happening to them physically. And, you know, that's another component of the end phenomenon is just feeling really, really good and, and energetic. And an amazing thing that a lot of people say about this program is that they, they feel very bright about their future, that they, they, they feel hopeful and they feel ready to go. And one of the things that we do with the Sauna Pure program is we have people after the sauna meet with a personal trainer um, and for, for several sessions with a personal trainer so that they actually can can build on the health benefits from the sauna and can now start the exercise program that they've been meaning to do forever. They've, they've done a little exercise on a daily basis uh, right before the sauna, right after they take their niacin, and they've gotten into the habit now of every day doing that. But now we actually put them with eight sessions with a personal trainer where they can get set uh, on their program for life. And at the same time, they may then be coming back to me or their own doctor for a really good, from here on out, nutritional program. Like, you know, how should I eat to prevent the buildup of toxins again? Is it safe for someone who's had a previous heart attack? We have put some people who have had heart problems through this. We do request that they do get an approval from their cardiologist. And uh, usually if they've had a heart problem, they, they're, they're already seeing a cardiologist and they're getting various stress tests and things like that. So uh, yes, it can be very safe. In fact, niacin was the very first cholesterol-lowering drug. 
and to date it, it has still been shown to lower the cholesterol at least as much, if not more, than the best-selling prescription cholesterol-lowering drug in the world, Lipitor. Unlike Lipitor, niacin not only lowers the bad cholesterol, but it raises the good cholesterol, something that Lipitor um, does not do nearly as effectively. And niacin also has an anti-clotting effect. So obviously in people who have had heart problems, there's, in most of those patients, there's been a, a clot in the heart artery, and niacin is very, very good for that. So we find that this program um, is, is really an excellent alternative for cardiac patients as long as they're in shape enough to be able to tolerate the heat and the, the bit of exercise that goes with it. And that's why we do require a, a cardiologist okay for those folks. Uh, let's see if there's another question. I get headaches when I detox. Is this normal? Um, it's common to get all kinds of symptoms. People can get headaches, nausea, all kinds of things. If the detoxification is too much too soon, in other words, not taken on a gradient, or if the detoxification is done in the absence of supportive nutrients. And so although people in this detox are aware of sometimes detoxing while it's happening there in the sauna, as much as possible, we're, su we're supporting them so tremendously as the niacin goes up, the vitamins and minerals, the essential oils, and the lecithin is going up right along with that. So we avoid these, these adverse effects. In fact, in our program, in Sonapir, if somebody gets a headache, we immediately look at, okay, what happened? Did you not take the oil? Did you not take enough electrolytes? Are you behind in water? And water is the number one thing that, that we consider. And people a lot of times are having to drink a lot more water than they're used to because they're sweating it out so much. So in the Sauna Pure program, if there's any symptom like that, then, then we kind of just put on the brakes and, and figure it out and, and get you relieved of that headache. And we definitely don't want you taking drugs while you're on this. That's just like putting more toxins in your body while you're trying to get rid of them. If there is a headache, then something's out on the program. So, you know, we get we we have very good success of people going through this without, um, you know, suffering the effects of detox, so to speak. Let's see if there's another question. Um, Okay. Uh, well, at this point, I guess I'll ask if there's if there's any other questions. Like I said, this is a long-range deep tissue detoxification. It's really getting at where the the toxins are stored, which is in the fat. And there's there's other things that people can do. For instance, on a daily basis, um, in terms of herbs, foods. Um, there's another webinar on zeolite, for instance. But this is this is different from ongoing programs. This is. Uh, a commitment for three to five weeks when you're doing um, the, the vitamins, the minerals, the supportive oils, and uh, certain durations in the sauna to really uh, sweat it out. And uh, the, the skin, you know, is, is, is the largest detoxification organ that the body has. And we really utilize that fact and, and promote sweat. And sweat, of course, like I said, is the, the oldest known form of detoxification. In fact, in one of the prior webinars, I had a quote from Hippo Hippocrates, the father of ancient medicine, who uh, is quoted to have said, give me sweat and, and I will cure disease. So it goes way, way back, but we today combine it with the technology of niacin, which is little old vitamin B3, and uh, it's really powerful. Um, is this program... Uh, aimed at fat or at organ detox. This is aimed at fat detoxification, but there's all kinds of side benefits. The body stores toxins preferentially in the fat in order to keep it from going into the bloodstream and being distributed in organs such as the brain, the liver, etc. Only when that mechanism is overcome do many of these toxins then leach out. Now there are some exceptions. Lead we know preferentially stores in the bones. But it's probably a similar type of mechanism. It's being stored there to prevent it from being in the bloodstream because it's when lead is in the bloodstream that it can get into the brain where it really does its damage. But the majority of the toxins we're talking about, the so-called organic toxins, which means that they just are made, they have um, a heavy representation of carbon molecules. In other words, these are the toxins that are uh, more like our own biological molecules because 
they're made basically of carbon to a great extent. These end up storing in the fat and they spare the organs because they're stored in the fat. On the other hand, niacin regenerates the body's own detoxifier and glutathione is the body's major detoxifier and glutathione works in all organs. And right now, if you take glutathione by mouth, it doesn't seem to really um, get absorbed or, or really take action like our body's own glutathione does. But niacin regenerates the, bo the body's stores of glutathione. That's going to help all organs. Niacin also regulates the genes that help the liver detoxify. And the liver is one of our prime detoxification organs. Um, so even though we, you know, have the, um, the focus on the toxins residing in the fat, there's a lot that the other facets of the, you know, especially the niacin of the program do that helps the body in an overall basis that is going to affect toxins in the organs. Are these programs available across the country? Uh, yes, they are and you can contact either of the uh, websites there or click in the right upper hand uh, corner of your webinar screen and you can inquire about other programs around the country and um, we can uh, hook you up with who's doing the program in your area. Um, the uh, way the program is done these days is to, in sort of batches, in other words several people sign up and then they all go through it together. Uh, this is definitely a program that uh, it seems to be helpful to pass the time and to have a little camaraderie and all that to have more than one person going at once. In fact, we don't let a person do it themselves. They always have to have at least another person there. And of course, the sauna supervisor is always there. Uh, but right now these are done in sort of batches, so there's a few people going through at once depending on how big the sauna is. Now this is the exact same detoxification program that the 9-11 rescue workers went through. And in New York they had a really big sauna that you know, some 15 or 20 guys could go through all at once. You know, and they would just put batches of these guys through. And to date there's been nearly a thousand of the rescue workers that have gone through this in New York. And, and of course they have, a, like I said, a much bigger sauna than what, what you would normally find, find uh, in, in a normal sauna center or in a health club. Um, but the entire sauna pure program is is more than just the sauna. It's the sauna, and it's hooking you up with a personal trainer and getting you actually on a program. Because when people come out of the sauna, they go like, "Okay, now I have a new lease on life. I feel great. I'm ready to change my life." And uh, so we really like to take advantage of that uh, renewed enthusiasm for being physically healthy from here on out and not just right now and and get them in with a personal trainer and then um, in, in Austin what we do where I'm at in Texas is then the people come back to me and and we really look at how they're eating on a regular basis and, and what their specific uh, biochemically individual nutritional needs are, uh, as well as, of course, like I said, balancing the hormones and uh, making sure we've really optimized their physical functioning. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Any other questions? I think I've, I've answered all the questions. And again, this is the third part of a series of three of cancer and toxins. Of course, we talk a lot more about other things besides cancer. These toxins can affect multiple systems. Uh, and um, I really urge you, if you found anything interesting here, to go to Building Strength Webinar's website and look in the archived editions for the first and second part of the series, which, which really goes into more depth on the President's report on environmental toxins and, and, and really um, the, the, second, the second one actually goes into much more depth on the details of what the Sauna Peer program is. Um, so any other questions? I, I, um, I, I really just want to express to you the tremendous um, benefits that I've seen of this program as a physician in, in my patients and, and especially totally aside from what's happening to the body, this, this idea of hope. You wouldn't believe how much we see this word hope showing up in the, the testimonials and the success stories of our participants and, and sort of a new lease on life and now I can do what I want to do 
uh, physically and otherwise in my life. So I, I really encourage you to check it out. Well, I guess that's it, David. Uh, I, I want to also encourage people to tune into my webinar on Thursday where I'm just going to basically describe what is an anti-aging doctor, what does regenerative medicine mean, and what can be done to help you in this field of functional medicine, longevity, and successful and supportive aging. And that's going to be here at Building Strength webinars on Thursday night, so make sure to register for that.